Good evening. I'm David Gergen, and I have the pleasure to welcome you to one the Kennedy School Forum, one of the prestigious forums in this community, one of the most prestigious forums in this community. And tonight we're graced by the presence of Wendy Kopp. Uh, we're delighted to have you here, Wendy. Thank you. And uh, she's going to be engaged in a conversation with the dean of the school. Uh, a few words about Wendy Kopp. When she was a senior at Princeton in 1989, she wrote a senior thesis uh, calling for a teacher corps. Uh, be careful of what you write in a senior thesis uh, because uh, she decided to try to put it in, in, into action. Many people ple believed it would never work. Uh, within the first year, she had 2,500 applications. It got off the ground quickly. Uh, some philanthropists helped um, to make it a reality. But it has now grown into the, I think, that uh, foremost force for education reform in the country. Uh, it is an enormously successful program that has had a, uh, an extraordinary appeal uh, to the younger generation. As many of you know, Teach for America uh, asks uh, see college seniors to apply and then, if, if accepted, to spend two years teaching in the toughest uh, urban and rural schools in the country. Uh, this last year, uh, she, there were 6,000 spots available. There were 60,000 applications, 10 to 1. Almost as hard to get into Harvard as it is to get into uh, Teach for America. Uh, they have 32,000 alumni now. Uh, and what's interesting about this is Cynic said in the beginning, the folks who come in to Teach for America, they're just going to punch their card and um, improve their resume, and off they're going to go to business school or law school or something of that sort. 65% of the alumni are working full time in education reform. That's a remarkable number. And, in, and if you look at the successes around the country, let me just tell you just for a moment about New Orleans. Before Katrina, the graduation rate in New Orleans in high school was 54%. Uh, the, the hurricane actually turned out to be a blessing in disguise in many, in many ways because it brought a great number of young people who wanted to come to New Orleans and participate in the renewal of New Orleans and Teach for America was right out there in front. Uh, today, one in five New Orleans teachers comes from Teach for America. 40% of the school principals are TFA alums. And the graduation rate has gone from 54% to 78%, several points above the national average. That's progress. For New Orleans, so there's a miracle going on in New Orleans, as is beginning to appear in, in a number of other cities that I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more about tonight. Excuse me, if you can tell, I'm, I'm an advocate. I happen to, I have the privilege of being on the board uh, and serving with some other folks in, in this good university, uh, and I'm, I'm a big believer in it. Wendy, as time went on, and this was such a success, other countries noticed. They started coming to her and said, can you help us start Teach for America in our country. Uh, and she formed an organization called Teach for All. It's a global organization. And in the last year, a couple of years, she's made a transition from being the active CEO of Teach for America to being the chairman, an active hands-on chairman of the board for Teach for America as she's taking on responsibility for this global challenge. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that tonight. This has not been an easy ride. Education is terribly politicized in this country today, far more than it should be. You know, whether it's Common Core, as we saw what happened in Indiana yesterday, or it's charter schools that are controversial, say in New York, um, and there's a political fight over that on one issue after another. This is, these are really difficult issues, but still, the young people sign up and say, sign me up, I wanna go do this. So we're gonna hear from her tonight, and, uh, and as I say, having this conversation with the, our, our dean, who has been here now some 10 years. And um, he, he, you should know that before he became dean and became absorbed with trying to renew and build this school, in which he's done such a wonderful job, he was renowned as a scholar and, and as someone who brought theory to practice and was a major, major architect of welfare reform in this country, which has, was a, a very, very difficult issue, but he's been a scholar on poverty and other issues. He's a perfect person to talk to Wendy uh, about how are we going to close the education gaps in this country so that no children would be left behind and one day all children, as Wendy would say. Thank you. Uh, over to you, David. Thank you. Uh, Wendy, it's, it's a tremendous honor having you here. As you know well, 
we have quite a few Teacher America graduates uh, here in the school at any one time and, and many more of our own graduates. So uh, and, uh, we share your passion for making the world a better place. And indeed, I'd like to just start by asking you, um, you know, this is always described as someone who's seen your thesis and even in your book, you're, well, what should I write about? And all of a sudden there's this and then you, for the last 25 years, uh, near as I can tell, you've gotten no sleep. She's even got a cold today, so uh, be aware. Um, where does this passion come from? Yeah. And what keeps feeding it? Um, I think my initial passion, uh, well, they're, they're linked, but I think different things may probably, this is. We'll work on it, don't worry about it. Okay. Um, <coughs> kept me going and led me to start. Um, I mean, honestly, the, the original, I mean, I was obsessed. I mean, uh, literally the minute I thought of this idea, I was obsessed. And, and it's true that I've been obsessed ever since. But the thing that first led me to be obsessed about it, I mean, I was a college senior. Honestly, I was in, I, I was in, in a true funk. I mean, I really was in a deep funk. I, I actually, you know, I'd never been in a funk before. I'd been a very motivated, driven by whatever was in front of me person, but literally I didn't want to do a thesis and I didn't want to do any of the things that seemed like they were presenting themselves to me as things to do after you graduated. I, I actually just didn't want to do it. Um, you know, I, we were called the me generation and supposedly we just all wanted to go work on Wall Street and I just thought, first of all, actually I don't know anyone who is dying to go work on Wall Street. I mean, not that it's a problem if there are people who, who do, but I, I didn't know any of them and yet everyone was applying to these. The, the only recruiters were investment banks and management consulting firms. And I actually was trying to figure out what else could I possibly do? And uh, you know, I was a person with few connections. Like <laughs> I didn't have the connections to figure out how do you work on Capitol Hill, although I was trying to figure, I was writing the letters, trying to get internships, you know? And, and I just felt like, you know what? One day, I, I had become very focused on this issue. I was in the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Policy. I'd become very focused on this, on the issue. I'm mean, honestly, as an academic matter, um, and, and with some personal connection to it through, through folks I knew at Princeton who'd gone to public schools in the South Bronx and such, but to the issue of educational inequity, just the reality that in our country, I mean, it's almost inconceivable, right? Like we are a place that aspires to be a place of equal opportunity and yet, and we call ourselves the land of opportunity, but where you're born determines the educational outcomes you get and and your life outcomes as a result. And that just seemed not right. So I organized a conference on this together with some other folks. And it was at that conference where I realized, you know what, why aren't we being recruited as aggressively to commit two years to teach in our high poverty communities as we were being recruited at the time to commit two years to work on Wall Street? I mean, it was just so clear to me, like all of a sudden, like that is it. We will have thousands of people wanting to channel their energy into something as meaningful as teaching in incredibly high need communities. There were incredible teacher shortages at the time and just incredible needs in, in urban and rural communities. And I thought that would make a real difference in the short term and that it would make a real difference in the long run as well. I mean, I had this idea from the very start that you know we take all these folks who are going to be our nation's future leaders and we have their first two years out of college be working on Wall Street. What if their first two years was teaching in urban and rural communities. Like we would change the consciousness of our country. We'd change everything in the end. We'd change the priorities, the career paths, the, you know, the consciousness of our country. I mean, that, I was obsessed with this idea, just as an, as an idea. I think once I got started, you know, I saw through our incredible, part, you know, committed teachers um, and ultimately alumni, um, you know, the, the magnitude of the problem we were addressing and honestly, the possibility that, it, that we could solve it. I mean, you know, to see that juxtaposition every day, like to see what happens when you meet kids who are so far behind with the kind of supports that they need and, and with high expectations and to see them excel, I mean, you realize, you know, we can make a meaningful difference against this problem and I, I, as we progressed, I saw that on bigger and bigger scales. Like, yes, we can have whole classrooms that help put kids on a trajectory to greater opportunity. We can do this in whole schools. We can actually make a meaningful difference in whole communities. I mean, you just start realizing, that's why I've never left, is you just realize, wow, like, 
people are everything. This is true in education at least as much as it's true in every other sector. And if we channel, you know, our most precious resource, our most educated, capable talent against this problem, we will make a meaningful difference in our lifetime. So that, that's kind of what's kept me going. And so uh, one of the things you mentioned in a uh, wonderful book, if you haven't read it, called uh, One Day All Children, The Unlikely Triumph of Te Teach for America and What I Learned From It. It's just a wonderful story, and partly it's a wonderful story because you also mentioned that you did actually apply for a number of these jobs, and nobody made an offer. And the last one that turned, that turned you down was Morgan Stanley. I wonder how different the world might have been had that offer come through, although I suspect you wouldn't have taken it anyway. I don't think I would have, but <laughs> yeah. So you, but you also were incredibly um, courageous, perhaps people would have said foolish at the time. You said, I'm gonna start big, I'm gonna do this, it can be done, in spite of everybody saying, whoa, whoa, slow down, take your time, whatever. I want yeah. 500 people the first year, I need two and a half million dollars, <laughs> I'm gonna go crazy recruiting yeah. them. You've got the 500 people recruited, only one small problem, you didn't have the money raised yet. So yeah. you have 500 people you've made a commitment to, spectacular people and so forth. Is this a strategy you would recommend to others? <laughs> this is a really tough question because, um, so I had, as I have articulated, I guess, you know, real conviction in this idea. But beyond that, the timing for this was absolutely perfect, right? Like, it was one of those things, I swear to you, if I hadn't started it, someone else was going to start it within the next six months. I was actually right about that analysis. I mean, the mood on college campuses, it was true. Like, I wasn't alone. I was one of thousands of people who were just searching for a way to make a real difference in the world without finding the path. Um, the environment in school districts, I mean, this was the days of headlines of, you know, schools opening in New York and LA with 1,200 vacancies. So the school districts were ready and, and waiting for this. Um, and the fall of my senior year, Fortune Magazine ran a cover story that said corporate America is gonna take on America's schools or something like this. Like they were committing themselves to, you know, improving education and, and they actually didn't know what to do. And, you know, I knew that there was a lot of corporate philanthropy out there and, and a lot of philanthropy and it, it went to lots of things that were much less impactful than this. I mean, this is, there's a little bit of naivete in this, but, um, so I don't know, all roads led to, in my mind, like I was actually, I didn't feel like I was taking a risk. I felt like this is gonna happen, it's gonna work, we can make it work. And I am glad in retrospect that I did it, of course, because it did work out, um, but you but know. But there were a lot of sleepless nights and near missing of payrolls and all that, right? Yeah, Along this way. is true, this is true. And, and ultimately, you know, you know, ultimately that strategy didn't fully work for us. <laughs> like ultimately we had to figure out a different way of operating that was a little more, same um, to gain stability. Mm -hmm. But in terms of other, you must get the question constantly from other people, you are after all in some ways the, the most prominent uh, social entrepreneur out there um, about you know, how should they think about it and so forth. Do you have some sort of pearls that you typically share or would like to share? It's By the way, I've tough. heard from several people who yeah. called you early on and just just the fact that you were willing to take a call and said hang in there and stuff made as much difference as, yeah. as anything. I mean, even now, like working with all these, the, teach, the entrepreneurs, the social entrepreneurs who are starting the Teach for Malaysia's or the Teach for India's or, you know, um, in San Chile, et cetera. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a balance. I think if we all waited for the revenue we needed before we launched, you know, we wouldn't exist. I mean, I'm slightly terrified even talking about this year because I'm starting a new entrepreneurial venture, in all honesty, through Teach for All that doesn't have a clear path to revenue, you know? It, we're starting up, we are, we've got big ambitious goals, we feel it's important to meet them, we don't see a clear path to the revenue we need, and you know, we're trying to make smart, judicious calls that will, you know, it's worked for us in the last six years, but you know, I, I just think this is, this is the life of social entrepreneurs, you know? And we wouldn't be making the impact we're making um, if we didn't take a little bit of, of risk. But it, it's, you know, it's tough, it's, you know. So one of the things that's, that's quite striking, you said it here, but also in everything else that uh, Teacher for America's done is unbelievable emphasis on recruiting. Uh, it sort of, it wasn't just, you know, by the way, you should apply for 
Peace Corps or AmeriCorps or something, you spend enormous time on campuses, individual recruiters for some individual campuses and so forth. Indeed, it was so phenomenal that a few years back, I organized a round table in Washington, D.C. on federal hiring practices, which I think are truly appalling. Um, and that's particularly important since, you know, the Kennedy School, a certain number of our students would like to work for the federal government. And uh, I got the heads of the major unions, uh, I got the, you know, head of the Office of Personnel Management, some cabinet secretaries, people from Congress, and so forth, but um, um, professors. And then I wanted to present them with people that really did know how to do recruiting right. So we had the head of personnel for Google. Uh, we had the head of recruiting for GE, the head of diversity for IBM, and Teach for America. Because in many ways, Teach for America was even more effective in terms of its able the capacity to reach out to idealistic young people and the like. Indeed, uh, um, Lisa Clapp, I guess, who's your yeah. SVP for recruitment, or was then, was a part of that. So, but. Tell me more about why this preoccupation. I mean, they're terrific yeah. folks. You spend enormous money on this. I mean, yeah. is it worth it? Although we don't spend nearly as much as some other <laughs> institutions out there, like our banks, consulting firms, and even the US military. So I, I will say, I mean, this is the core proposition of Teach for America. I mean, the, the thing that you know we've realized we need to obsess not only about recruitment, but about, you know, and selection, but about how to train and support them as well. But, you know, this is our mission. Like, you know, we think, you know, uh, truly, if you, if you get a bunch of people working to improve education in a room and ask them, what is the constraint? It's not money, right? Like, it's, it's people. And we have a world that sends, I mean, I was just in Singapore last week, right? And Singapore is known as, I mean, first of all, it's got one of the highest performing education systems in the world, um, excellence, equity, the whole bit. And they get, they're known around the world, they get the top third of their folks in terms of academic caliber to, to channel their energy into teaching. And, you know, I wasn't there to pitch the teach for all model, actually. I was there for other reasons entirely. But they just couldn't get over it because they said, wait a minute, like, so you mean our top talent, like the folks who go into finance and law and medicine, you're channeling those people into education. And I'm thinking, Aren't you doing that? They say, oh no, we don't do that. Here our top talent goes into finance, law, and medicine. <laughs> so I just think education is so fundamental to everything else. We all know this, right? Like if we could see rising educational levels and decreasing educational disparities, the world would just be a better place we would see, you know. And yet we, t we our most precious resource, we channel it consistently, really across borders into finance and you know, law and medicine, which, you know, thank heaven, we've got good people going into medicine. Um, not that we don't good, need good bankers and good lawyers as well, but we should just have more equity in this. And how do you fix that? You don't fix that by just saying, hey, anyone want to teach? <laughs> no. Um, so, you know, we go about it. We, we actually spent a lot of time trying to understand what do all these banks and consulting firms do? And we realized, wow. So McKinsey gives 20 Harvard alums who work at McKinsey a million dollars, and this was 10 years ago, and says, go get the 10 best folks you can find at Harvard to come work at McKinsey. That was our competition. So that informed the Teach for America recruitment strategy. We don't have a million dollars, and we don't have 20 alums from Harvard hanging out with time to go wine and dine people at Harvard, so what are we gonna do? And, and you know, it, it informed our strategy in big ways, you know. We realized that in addition to the marketing stuff and the, the kind of positioning of Teach for America, we were going to have to do the same kind of relationship building that they did. And, and it informed this approach of identifying our top prospects and cultivating them over time. Um, and it's why, you know, I don't know, you know, there are different perceptions out there about Teach for America, but this is not just, you know, we put up a sign and a bunch of people come apply. It's why we've attained the level of, not only the numbers, but the level of the caliber and the diversity of the folks who come in to Teach for America. You know, 55% of our core last year, you know, had experienced in some way the inequities we're working to address, either growing up in a low-income community or, you know, sharing the race and ethnicity of, of the vast majority that, of, of kids who Teach for America works with. Um, and that does not happen um, without a deep, deep commitment to diversity and an incredible focus of 
our resources on recruiting a, a diverse core that's far more diverse than, say, our top 350 college campuses, 17% of the grads of whom grew up in low-income communities, 6% of the seniors are Latino, 5% are African American. We are so much more diverse than that. Uh, we need a lot of people from those top 350 schools. It's, I mean, we find a lot of people beyond those top 350 schools, but of course we need people from those schools channeling their energy into education, and they've got to be a lot more diverse than the people in those schools now if we're going to be successful in this effort. So yeah, we think putting a lot of energy into very intentionally recruiting the folks we really need um, to drive the kinds of not only immediate changes in classrooms, but long-term changes over time is, is so let me ask the question that many people here have. What do you have to do to get into Teach for America? What are you looking for? Um, you know, we're basically, uh, I mean, first of all, we've done a lot of studies. We continue to do a lot of studies over time. I mean, now the beauty is we've got all these programs around the world doing lots of studies, trying to figure out what is it that differentiates the most successful teachers and the alumni who go on to make the greatest impact. Like, what can we see at the front end that differentiates the people who have the greatest impact, basically. I think at a high level, you know, we could summarize what we're looking for as, you know, leadership qualities. Um, we've seen that teaching successfully in our highest need classrooms truly is an act of leadership. You know, you're going into a situation, um, your kids are far behind, the resources to meet their extra needs are often not readily apparent, and you need to figure out not how to just survive the year, but how to put your kids on a different trajectory, you know? And that takes vision, it takes the ability to get your kids on an absolute mission so that they're working with you to get there. It takes a lot of purposeful and relentless energy. So we look for those things in people's past, perseverance, the ability to influence and motivate others, problem solving ability, um, you know, a deep commitment to this mission and ability to work with others with respect and humility, um, yeah. And so now, um, once they're there, um, what's the experience like for the, for the teachers? Well, there's no way to make it easy, <laughs> um, as no doubt any of you who have known or been a Teach for America Corps member will, will you know, attest. Um, I think, uh, you know, they're, they're working again in, in the most challenging teaching context. It's, they're seeing their kids bring in to their classrooms so many challenges that more privileged kids would never know exist. And, and they're working in schools that were never set up to meet the extra needs of these kids. So the only way to feel successful is to go way above and beyond our traditional expectations for what should even be the responsibility of, of a teacher. So it, it's, it's incredibly challenging. Um, you know, Teach for America has been on such a journey, um, as are all these other Teach for All programs at the moment, but, you know, to figure out how do we s help set our core members up for as great a success as possible? You know, how do we provide the kind of intensive pre-service training um, and professional development that they need? How do we, you know, we've discovered over time that probably the best expenditure of our resources is in the ongoing coaching and in-service development that they get during the two years. Um, you know, how do, we, how do we do that? How do we provide the kind of coaching and support um, that will help folks, you know, be successful with their kids, not just survive, um, but actually help put their kids on, on a path, um, you know, again, to, to greater opportunity. So obviously, uh, you've become a target of criticism as well. Um, three things, some of which are sound familiar for us. Um, there's a sort of certain arrogance, uh, sort of look, we want to take the best college kids from the best universities and so forth, and they're going to waltz. We're going to give them five weeks of training, and they're going to waltz in and be teachers. Uh, related to that, people will emphasize sometimes the fact that uh, a significant majority of people don't stay beyond five years in teaching per se, although maybe in other things. And, um, and it's related sort of like, you know, anybody who's been a teacher or even the college uh, level, which is much easier, uh, at first you're just so-so. You have to learn it, you get better, and so forth. Um, and is this creating more instability than others? So how do you respond to those? You hear these yeah. things all the time. How do you respond to that? Um, it's very easy 
to tear this apart, right? Like, especially if you're sitting up here in an ivory tower. And I think that's a lot of the issue that we face. Like, I think, you know, if, if you're actually situating yourself in the urban and rural communities in, in which we're working, first of all, you realize, okay, whatever we've been doing, it's not sufficient. I mean, hopefully we can all agree on, on that. You know, whatever our current approaches are, they're not sufficient. You know, we've got a world where 8% of our low-income kids will get through college in the same country where 80% of the top quartile family income kids will get through college, like pretty radical disparity. And it's even worse than that. I mean, it's hard to internalize that, but you get into these high schools and some of these communities and realize we're actually graduating in some cases 30% of the kids in this high school. And you know, the kids we're graduating have an eighth grade skill level on average. So you know, we're letting in our country, we're just letting the cycle of poverty perpetuate itself, even in the face of evidence that we can provide kids the kind of education that gives them the tools to get out of poverty. So you know, when you get into that, you realize, first of all, I mean, I don't think we can blame any one person, actor, or group for this problem, right? Like, it is a deeply systemic problem. Um, I, I've said this before in this talk even, but you know, it, we don't have it because teachers are terrible. That, that's, in my assessment, that, that's not why this problem exists. It, we have this problem because the kids are facing incredible challenges, um, inconceivable to most people in this country, right? And you know, again, they, they're, they're showing up at these schools that were never set up to meet their extra needs so that they could have equal outcomes. So, you know, you've got teachers stuck in the system and kids stuck in the system, and it's perpetuated by a lot of mindsets about what's possible for low-income kids or what's, you know, and, and policies and practices that kind of derive from those mindsets. So you've got this big, vicious cycle. Um, you know, we're not going to be able to solve that problem through fixing any one thing. Right? Like, you can't fix the teachers and fix that problem. Heroic teachers can maybe help mitigate it for the kids growing up today, but, you know, heroic teaching is probably not attainable. Uh, you know, a million teachers working with low-income kids in our country for not just two years, but their whole lifetime. I mean, so, you know, ultimately we're going to need to make a lot of change to fix that problem. Um, we need, you know, who, who's going to do it? That's, that's, I guess, the question, like, who's gonna do it? Um, because we know we can have change. Like, people can create a lot of change. Like, we see that. We see that in Teach for America. We see it in a lot of other things. So we just think, we gotta channel a lot of, we've gotta channel our, our most equipped energy and talent and, and people um, against that, that problem if we're gonna ensure that our country lives up to its ideals. And yeah, we think having them teach for two years, I mean, think, it's not about us, right? It's about the school principals. They keep hiring our people. This year, we have a 1,000 more requests for core members than we're gonna be able to meet from, from the schools in the communities in which we're working. Like, they want these folks. They know what they're getting, and they want them because they think they bring a tremendous amount of commitment, a tremendous amount of energy. They know they commit two years. They're hoping they'll keep them. Um, it's actually, you know, they stay at, greater rates during the two-year commitment because there's such churn in these schools far beyond our core members. Um, and many of them stay beyond their two years, so they're thinking, you know, we want to bet on this. Um, and we need some of them to stay in teaching, right? And they do, thank heaven. And, and you know, the more the merrier. But, but hopefully some of them will go, right? Because, again, the people who are out there criticizing Teach for America because supposedly we think everything can happen in schools and we should just fix schools and we're so heartless because we're ignoring poverty. No, this is why we have a two-year commitment. We need some of these people to leave and to figure out how to fix our urban and rural economies and the social services system and the healthcare system. Um, and we need others to leave the classroom because the minute you've taught, you know. Like, we can fix some of it through teaching, but we better change the way schools are set up and led and, and organized. And once you're a school principal, you realize we better change the way our school systems are functioning. So there's just, there's a lot of stuff that needs to get done. Um, and we think we need to channel as much energy and talent against it as, as we possibly can. Well, and this is one of the most interesting things in recent years. I mean, 
you've gone well beyond the, the you know, classic Teach for America model, if I can use that. You're also now focused on how do you get more of these graduates to become public policy leaders in one form or another. Uh, very uncommon, really. NGOs normally stick to your knitting, whatever, don't produce people to change the whole system, and that's often a criticism. Mm. Um, so I'd be interested in how you got there, uh, but on the other hand, it's also made you a target. You were always a target for <laughs> controversy, but this has really magnified it, and it feels more generally just the the amount of hostility and polarization around education is now mirroring to some degree the hostility and polarization is more broadly. So I mean, a why the leaders and b what's going on? I mean, what? Yeah. Um, how do you how do you help? help us understand was why education's got so polarized. Yeah, it is so unfortunate. And why are you such a target? Well, the, the way we got to the, you know, these various initiatives, leadership initiatives, like the political leadership initiative, or the social innovation initiative, or the school system leadership initiative, I mean, or the teacher leadership initiative, Teach for America has a number of initiatives to kind of support and accelerate the leadership of our alums. I mean, that was just a natural extension of the model, right? Like it was just, realizing just like we realized oh there's a lot more we could do to recruit you know a greater number of and a greater diversity of college student and there's a lot more we could do to better train and support them then we realized there's a lot more we could do to ensure that every one of them is maximizing their potential as alums and that led to these various initiatives to try to streamline and clarify the path to leadership like you start working for these consulting firms and it's clear two years and then this and then business school and then you know, and, and it's not as clear when you go into this kind of social change work. So we realized, you know, we'll, we'll keep a lot more people and, and we'll get them into positions of influence earlier and they'll have a greater impact if we do more to support them along the way. It was really just, just that. Um, you know, it is very unfortunate, I think, the state of the current public discussion around improving education. Um, you know, and I think you know, I think there were there are some folks who who have sort of taken some polarizing stances. I mean, some of them are probably are lumped certainly in, in the reformer camp, and some of them are very much about actually trying to send the message that. And I think truly believe that we don't have a problem, you know, today in, in American education, and and all these people trying to change things are misguided, and we want to kind of keep things the the way they are. And I think. Some of those folks have created a lot of, you know, real platforms and spend a lot of energy communicating. And I think a lot of other people who are working very, very hard to improve things for kids in particularly in our urban and rural communities, honestly, they have their heads down and they're not sharing out, <laughs> you know, as aggressively they're maybe more grounded and moderate views about what needs to happen. So I just think, I think we've let the public discussion become dominated by some extreme groups. And I think, I mean, there's lots of thinking among many people who are involved in, you know, really trying to, to change the status quo around how to, you know, just realizing sadly it doesn't work to put your head down and do the work. Like we're gonna have to figure out how to become a lot more sophisticated around um, you know, communicating, because if we lose the hearts and minds of, of the public and the policymakers and such, we're never going to get where, where we need to be. So hopefully, hopefully that will make a difference. Beyond communication, are the mistakes you've made, strategic mistakes, um, would you look back on and say, geez, wish I had that one back? Um, well, I think that the neat, well, in terms of TFA and, or in terms of, the, I mean, I think the most of the, you know, I think I think the controversy around Teach for America is in part a, a function of. I mean, there's just so much vitriol and contentiousness in the broader education reform movement. It's by the way, not just education. I mean, whether it's poverty yeah. or even bal or even you know, extending the debt ceiling. I mean, yeah, it's well, that's toxic. interesting because we think we're in a little bubble over here, but. I, I do think we would assess. Do you assess, notice they shut down the government? Uh, just <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. I mean, <laughs> but um, I think, you know, I would assess. I mean, I, I think, you know, when we convene various folks who are working hard to improve the education system, you know, there's lots of self-assessment that, you know, we made some missteps along the way. I mean, certainly. And I think there's a lot we can do to be more effective going forth. Um, you know, so absolutely, you know, I, I think, you know, we didn't pay enough attention to ensuring the diversity of 
our movement. I mean, that's true. I mean, you know, Teach for America, honestly, has been quite committed to it since the beginning, but we didn't, you know, we didn't gain as much traction as we have of late um, in ensuring that, you know, we have diverse folks, you know, shaping the direction of um, our work. And, and I think, you know, as you think about the broader education reform movement, um, you know, we've just got to ensure that people who are, who are guiding this movement are people who are deeply, deeply grounded, I mean, through their own life experiences in, you know, the inequities that we're working to address. And I think, you know, that, that's one thing. I think there's so much more we could have done to build the kind of collective and collaborative capacity of the folks working away at this so that we were all learning together, challenging each other, um, rather than working in silos and, uh, you know, I think we could have gotten further faster. Um, you know, so there, there's a lot we could have done differently, but there's a lot of, you know, we gotta, you know, be more effective going forth, and I, I think we will. All right, I wanna open this up to the audience. Uh, in just one second, I will call on you. I uh, wanna give you one chance to talk about Teach for All. Um, so there are microphones located in four locations, one right here, one right here, one right here, and one over here. Um, so, and I just would remind you a great, a good question at the Kennedy School consists of you're identifying yourself. It's very short containing but one thought and it ends with a question mark. But I did want to give you a chance to say a little bit about Teach for, teach for yeah. All and a little bit of questions. Um, well, I'm extremely excited about Teach for All. Um, you know, as you heard earlier, I guess from David, um, this started because, you know, actually I wasn't thinking about anything outside of our country. I mean, there's so much to be done in the United States. Um, but there was something in the water about eight or nine years ago, and I think within the course of a year, I had heard from 13 social entrepreneurs from, you know, India to Lebanon to Chile to the, the next place who were just absolutely determined to launch this model in their countries and we're looking for help and ultimately that led the founder of Teach First uh, who started in the UK about 11 years ago and I to start something called the Teach for All Network um, whose mission was going to be to support these folks and you know help accelerate the impact of this model around the world. Um, it's just been a fascinating, unbelievably, you know, I, I could never have predicted I think seven years ago what I would see or learn through this. Um, you know, first of all, I mean, we had lots of questions at the front end about whether this model would actually resonate across context. You know, would it be the kind of magnet for talent? Would we see the same alumni effect? Because that's really the core of what we're doing, right? It's not about two years. This is about every year thereafter. And in very different cultures and contexts, would we see these folks teach for two years and then go on and, you know, really work constructively to, to change things? Um, and, and then, you know, would, would this make sense in much less developed contexts where basic needs aren't being met? And, and I have to say, you know, we've seen just tremendous evidence that lead us to believe that this is incredibly relevant. Uh, you know, incredible, you know, a thousand people applying to teach for Pakistan for 40 spots, 2,400 people applying in Colombia for 60 spots, 13,000 people applied this year to teach for India despite their recruiting only at, you know, select universities still at this point in their, trajectory. Um, we're seeing very similar alumni effects, 50 to 70 percent of these cohorts continuing in education beyond the two years. We're already seeing some of these early folks pioneering new technology-based solutions, starting schools, you know, starting new teacher training, you know, efforts to retrain government prepared teachers, etc. Just incredible examples of the kind of pioneering leadership that we saw from the early years of, of the TFA alums. Um, and the feedback we're getting from much less developed contexts is we think this is a good idea in a place like the U.S., but wait till you see the impact in a much less developed context where there's a reason that the basic needs aren't being met and that the teachers aren't being trained and that we don't have curriculum, which is we don't have the capacity we need. And so even small cohorts of these folks, you know, can be the people to actually go out and, and meet the basic needs. So um, it's been very encouraging. And beyond that, I would just say, um, I really, I had no idea at the front end of this. I mean, I thought we were gonna help these folks, you know, and probably underestimated the degree to which they would innovate on this model, you know, and, and, and the degree to which the solutions would be shareable. I mean, the reality is that this problem that we see here, it exists all over the world. 
the things that drive it, the root causes, the patterns, it's so phenomenal to see how as diverse and different as places are, the nature of this problem is remarkably similar and it really means the solutions are shareable. So I'm realizing we're at the front end of something that's gonna have programs in ultimately, I don't know, nearly every country in the world channeling their top talent against this problem in diverse cultures that inspire innovation as part of a global network where people are sharing solutions. And I, th I think it just has huge potential to accelerate progress here in the US and around the world and, and, and that we have a great shot at, you know, really helping to fuel a movement that ends up increasing educational levels, decreasing educational disparities. So I'm, I'm very enthused about, about the possibilities. Exciting. So I'm going to start right over here. Sharon Darris, mid-career student here at the Kennedy School. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how the organization's culture has evolved over the past 25, 26 years. Um, Teach for America's culture, you mean? Yeah. Um, what, what's at the core of your question? Meaning? So, you know, initially, I, I think uh, the organization's been very focused on developing leadership, for example. You spoke about that a little bit earlier. But I mean, ha has that changed? And then also, I have some classes at the education school, for example, and I've noticed that uh, students who are recent alum of the organization speak about how they don't feel as passionate about the organization as they've heard the organization or older alum felt about their experience, yeah. you know, yeah. 10, 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's helpful. I, you know, I, there are lots of folks, you know, and I myself when I was there and, you know, my successors now who have worked very, very hard to build, a, you know, a, a culture around the core values of Teach for America, you know, transformational change, like the sense of urgency, like we have to make a meaningful impact you know, in our two years and every year thereafter because of the magnitude of this problem. You know, the value of diversity, the value of, you know, supporting each other through this, um, you know, among others. And, um, you know, I think, I, think, I think a few things have made this very challenging in recent years. One was the fact that Teach for America has grown absolutely, you know, quite dramatically. Um, we, we're still bringing in 500 people a year at our 10th year. And now we're bringing in 6,000 people a year, 11,000 teachers across 48 regions, um, you know, 2,500 staff, 32,000 alums. And, you know, there were many reasons to grow. And, um, you know, honestly, if we hadn't made those choices, we wouldn't be making the impact we're making in places like New Orleans and many other communities across the country. Um, but there are consequences to the pace of growth that we pursued. I mean, in hindsight, maybe we would have, I would have done that slightly differently. I mean, Jim Collins looked at our growth rate and was like, I missed a plane because of it. I mean, he's like pacing around saying, this is a disaster. Organizations take, you're gonna, it's gonna take you six years to dig yourself out because you just cannot maintain the kind of culture with this pace of growth. So I, I think that's part of what happened. I think another part of what happened, which compounds this is, you know, we're now operating in an environment where the critics of Teach for America um, who have a lot more communications capacity than we do in all honesty, you know, our people hear more from them than they hear from us and Teach for America is trying to change that and will change that. But I, I think that's another, another piece of the puzzle. So I, I think all of that has, has compounded things, things a bit. But there are lots of very good people at Teach for America working to get folks deeply centered in the values that this whole thing has to be built on and, and making lots of progress. So hopefully you'll start hearing different things um, before long. Great, right up here. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Bolger and I'm a Harvard alum. Uh, I grew up in Michigan and uh, places like Detroit and Flint, Michigan have uh, very disparate uh, funding for public schools compared to wealthier areas in the same state. And my question is, with regard to educational reform, do you think it's realistic to demand more equitable funding per pupil, per school, or should education reform focus on other remedies? Is it unrealistic to demand equality of funding for students? I mean, I think many of the folks who've been working for improved outcomes have successfully you know, created much greater equity. Um, and in fact, in some of these school systems, you know, we have even better systems that, that actually put more money into the highest need kids. 
Um, so I, I think that's absolutely a piece of the puzzle. I think it, it probably has to come in concert with efforts to better spend the resources we do we do spend because I think there's such um, sort of public discontent with you know the outcomes that we're seeing for the dollars we are spending. But I, I think you know we've seen. Um, you know, many people working to improve the system who have succeeded in creating greater equity in, in finance uh, while creating significant change at the same time. Who are here? Uh, my name is Peter. I'm a postdoc in the physics department, and though I don't often admit this, I actually went to Princeton. So um, I, my question is on inner city STEM education. And so if you, I'm, I'm not a statistician, but you know, if you have a graduate degree in any kind of physical science or engineering, you're basically gonna have a good job, right? The unemployment is like sub 1% for physicists or something. And yet when we look, right, if, you're, if we ask how many people get those, say, graduate degrees that come from, say, the lower quartile and from an underrepresented minority, it's basically zero, right? I mean, you have to look very, very hard. It's almost, you know, I don't know, one in a million or something. But, uh, is and uh, in a very naughty ideological way, like nobody seems to have anything close to a reasonable solution, right? And and you know you could when when there's zero, there's no real base to build on. So I was wondering if you had some thoughts on is there an actual practical way to to take you know to get get this going? Um, I personally think it has. I, I think it's it's an important piece of what has to be a broader solution. I mean, when you get your head around you know, the, the situation, you know, and you realize our fourth graders are reading at a first grade level in our low income communities, first or second grade level, depending on the place. Um, you know, their math skills are also a couple years behind. Um, you know, and again, even the kids who are graduating from high school at an eighth grade skill level, like, you know, th there's a, th that's, that's a root of, of this issue, right? So they need stronger, you know, math science education, but it's gotta be in a context of, you know, we've gotta get our kids to, to a higher level. And so I think all the efforts that are, are, that people are undertaking right now to say, first of all, we need to be teaching to, to, towards more rigorous standards. Um, you know, we've gotta, you know, take on all of the reforms that we're working to take on to, to increase, you know, improve the education that goes on in our urban rural areas. I mean, I do think all of those things will ultimately, you know, there, there are today, and, and we didn't really get into this, but, you know, things have changed a lot over the last couple of decades, over the last 25 years. I mean, I think we've lost perspective entirely. Uh, but I'll go to any given place and I'll remember what things were like in Oakland, California 25 years ago when we started placing there. And things are still not where they need to be in Oakland, California. But if you just look at the map of schools and their academic performance levels, it was a sea of red based on the California you know, sort of accountability system, even 12 years ago, just red, red dots in every school. Now it's like green and blue. And, and you know, there's still some failing schools, but there are many schools that are putting the kids you're, you're talking about on a path to get into and through college. But, but we don't see that outcome. I guess what I'm saying is well, that- Well, you will. Like You'll start seeing it. I mean, we're gonna start seeing, and, and it's gonna be small numbers in the beginning, but there are schools, I mean, absolutely you're gonna start seeing it. I really believe, I mean, there's no way to have happen what's happening. You know, we are sending more kids, more low income kids, you know, through college with strong skills and, and we have to see it in our STEM field. Teach for America, by the way, 30% of our teachers are teaching at both high school level and math and science. I mean, I, I do think there's quite a focus on, on STEM. It's just, you know, we've, we've gotta take on, on the problem in, in sort of a holistic way. That, that's my personal belief. Right over here. Hi, Wendy. Tony Wagner. I was on the faculty of TFA the first summer you, you may recall. Were, yeah. Author most recently of Creating Innovators and the Global Achievement Gap. Uh, when you described the education landscape and the debates taking place today, you didn't mention that, in fact, there's a growing number of us who are very deeply concerned that we're measuring the wrong things and that what gets tested is all that gets taught and that the ways in which we're assessing teacher effectiveness, and I know TFA uses these tests extensively for assessing your teacher's effectiveness, are in fact not the right indices that we desperately need accountability 2.0. And sadly, the new generation of Common Core tests appear to be pretty much the same, predominantly multiple choice tests that tell us really nothing about the skills that matter most in the adult world. The skills you need to get a job at Google, for example, aren't on the test, they aren't gonna be on the next generation test. So I'm wondering, what is TFA doing? What is Teach for All doing in even the global context to address the problem 
that our current accountability mechanisms are hopelessly obsolete and we need accountability yeah. 2.0. Well, I, I agree. So first of all, I mean, there's only, th I mean, you know, uh, I can't solve all problems, but uh, I think you'd find a whole lot of people who agree within the ranks of Teach for America. It is true. We believe that, you know, the world that we existed in, uh, I don't know when that was, certainly 20 years ago, 15 years ago, where, you know, we weren't measuring much. Um, right. That wasn't working. Like you know, you gotta met, you gotta understand where your kids are first of all to be an effective teacher. So you know, it's helpful to get to have some good assessments. We couldn't agree more. I mean, I think the Common Core is a big step forward from from where we've been. It's great to see you know standards that actually foster like higher level you know critical thinking. Hopefully, we're gonna see better and better assessments. You know, we're praying for that. I mean, it's you know, it's just not within our scope to go out and create them. It is within our scope to produce more people who can hopefully go out and fuel the, the movement to, to create them. Within Teach for America, we're, we're defining, you know, the outcomes that our teachers are working towards more broadly than academic outcomes as well. I mean, you know, and I think that is the question, you know, and, and we've actually sort of pushed this out to our communities, like in any given community, what is it that we're working towards for our kids? Like, what is the vision? In, you know, informed by the community allies and, and the students and parents and others in our communities, what is it that we're aspiring toward for our kids and what does that mean for what we need to be teaching toward? And, you know, we think academic skills are super important, but so are character skills and so is just an even an understanding of the society in which folks are growing up and the, and the challenges they're gonna face and their role in, um, you know, in, in kind of that context. So, um, you know, I, I guess I just think, I, I think again, I mean, honestly, there's so much polarization, there's so many assumptions about their out there about what people believe. There's a whole group of people who spend their days trying to position us as corporate reformers who want to privatize education and fire all teachers. And it's just like, I don't know who they're describing. So, you know, we need to do a better job of, of you know, getting the message out there about what we're really working toward. But, yeah. Okay. Right over here. Hi, Wendy. Uh, my name is Wyatt Smith. I was a 2011 core member in Alabama. I uh, taught US history in Birmingham. And currently at the business school uh, here at Harvard and have an interest in education technology. I'd love to learn your thoughts on sort of the ecosystem around ed tech and what excites you and what you think is has the best chance for helping to disrupt some of the cal calcifications mm -hmm. in our system, both in the United States and abroad. Well, the best news I've heard is that you are thinking about that because um, he was an incredible teacher. And we've never met, but I've watched the videos. Um, um, you know, I, I worry, I mean, I, I am worried, you probably know this, I, I am worried about our obsession with, I mean, I do go into some rooms where people assume that if we give kids a tablet, that is that could solve the problem. Let's just give kids tablets. Um, and I just think, you know, like everything else, like we can't fix the teachers and solve the problem, we're not gonna give kids computers and solve the problem. So I, I know you're not gonna get caught up in that like, you know, obsession, but, you know, good tech, you know, if we truly figure out how to leverage technology in a context where we have the other foundational elements right, I think it could just hugely accelerate progress. I mean, this has got to be the only sector left that, that hasn't just absolutely fundamentally changed the way we do things using the power of technology. Um, I mean, you would know better than I. I feel like I actually haven't seen um, you know, you, I've seen all the things that you've probably had more time to study than I've had to look at. You know, I think, um, you know, when you think about just even using technology as, as a tool for teachers, as a way to get, you know, kids and parents and teachers all information about, you know, where they are against hopefully more rigorous standards. Um, and ultimately as a way to, I mean, can't we figure out how to use some of this gaming technology that is so addictive for kids? Um, to actually help them learn good stuff, you know. So I think there are just there are probably multiple multiple applications, and and I just think I think we need more really successful teachers who actually know what it takes to help kids, help motivate kids, and and get them to learn to put their heads around it. Um, you know, I, I think that that'll help a lot. So. Right up here. Hi, oh, my name's Sita Gofard. Uh, I'm a junior at the college. Um, I wanted to ask you about your work with uh, Teach for All in comparison to Teach for America. I assume that as you expand your global mission, um, 
not all countries face the same you know, problems of excellence and equity in their education systems as the U.S. does. And likewise, I'm sure, I imagine at least, that um, many places in which you're starting to implement Teach for All um, have, I guess, received the idea, this novelty of the idea a little differently. Um, so I wanted to ask you what uh, are the couple of biggest differences between your work with Teach for All and Teach for America, and what are the challenges you're grappling with right now? Well, actually, so what's interesting is this problem that we're addressing is, it's pervasive all around the world. I mean, all around the world, socioeconomic background predicts educational outcomes. Um, I did just see kind of the latest kind of OECD report that shows that countries, you know, some countries are more successful than others at, at breaking that link, but in, in really every country, it, it's, still a, it's still predictive. Um, and, and it's probably much, a much bigger problem than most people realize. You know, you think about China where, you know, 80% of the urban kids, 40 million urban kids go to college and 3% of the 200 million kids in rural China are, you know, getting, are going to college or even going to college or even starting college. You know, we think about India, people are always talking about India and you've got all these folks writing columns about how we're losing the education race to India. They're educating 3% of their population in the way that anyone in this broader community is remotely educated, right? 60% of their kids don't get through fifth grade um, and 90% of them don't get through 12th grade. So they're just massive, you know, massive issues and, and inequities all over the world. Um, and, and honestly, I mean, there is a lot of diversity um, and there are some contexts where you just realize the challenges are so extreme. I mean, you know, you start breaking it down in India and just the scale of the problem, the, multi the hundreds of languages that are in use, the absolute, you know, there's no infrastructure at all. The state of the, you know, current systems around recruiting and training and compensating teachers are just, you know, we are, t it's just way, way far behind anything that we know. Um, so there, there are very extreme challenges, but what I would say is the most striking thing is the patterns, you know, um, really. Like if you start spending time in classrooms, you realize the existence of the most marginalized kids in these countries is much more similar to the existence of marginalized kids in other countries than it is similar to the privileged kids in those countries. And what they need in their teachers is much more similar than it is different, you know? And, and then you start talking to the school principals and realizing, wait, no, the mindsets, the mindsets that you run into that limit performance are, that's another universal. And then you get into the policy community. And so they're just, they're real patterns. Um, so I, I would say that's actually the, the biggest lesson I've taken. Like, you know, there are real patterns and it means the solutions are shareable. And, I think as a result, I've just come to believe, you know, as, as we're producing our future leaders, um, you know, let's produce them in a global context so that people are learning from each other and, you know, we're not all just reinventing the wheel. I mean, we can hugely, we can get where we're trying to go much, much more quickly if, if we're learning from each other. Sorry, this is gonna have to be the last question. Hi, Wendy, my name is Lisa Chin. I'm a Teach for Australia graduate and currently studying education policy, so I'm here because of you, thank you. Great. My question is, um, you talked about the similarities with and the universality of education reform around the world. What are some of the most promising and also disturbing trends that you see currently globally um, mm -hmm. within education policy? And is what role do you think that Teach for All can play with yeah. these trends? Um, you know, the thing that I've seen is that, you know, in, in this country, and, and I've, I've really seen this across the world, is that, you know, I do think there's a lot of commitment to improving education. I mean, people want to solve this problem, and they want to solve it, you know, quickly, like tomorrow would be good. And so that leads to this kind of lurch from one silver bullet solution to another. Mm -hmm. I could go back in this country and name each of the last, you know, 20 years in this. And if I go back far enough, I mean, you'd be amazed at what, what, what we thought was going to solve the problem, like project-based curriculum. If we could just engage all of our low-income kids in the same curriculum as the kids at Exeter, that would be it, you know, and, and we're probably about to come back to that. Um, but, you know, now we're in the era of the fix the teacher. I mean, fix the teacher will fix the problem. You know what? It won't be possible for reasons we've discussed, right? 
That is a phenomenon all over. I mean, it's amazing. I find myself in these government offices, and I mean, they're pursuing silver bullets based on evidence they think exists here, like magnet schools, just like the US. I'm like, which ones? <laughs> like, which thing are you pursuing? Um, so I, I do, I feel like that's the thing that we're up against. Um, anyone who's taught for Teach for Australia or for Teach for America knows there's no one thing. Like, it, this is gonna take doing a lot of things really, really well. And I think that's actually the biggest thing that we can, can bring to this. And, and it's, it's what I see this generation of folks bringing as they, you know, start running schools and running school systems and, and you know, coming into policy roles and, and such. Um, and I, I think that's, that's promising. There's more and more research out there too about what is differentiating the fastest improving school systems. Mm -hmm. Actually, there was just a report this week out about Massachusetts that Michael Barber uh, worked on with a bunch of folks looking at how can Massachusetts become the best in the world, you know, drawing on the research from other systems that have gone from good to great. And I, I think, you know, it's it's promising. Like we're learning more and more um, about about what it takes, and and the thesis of that is, you know, it's one that you know really is borne out by every context I've seen. Like if we want to go from good to great, we've got to figure out how to empower our school-based folks um, and give them true responsibility, but true freedom over, you know, how are we going to get there? And you know, I was just in Singapore, as, as I think I already mentioned, but. You know, everywhere you go, they're, they're saying, you know, our system's pretty good because we've got a bunch of school principals who are just absolutely passionate and absolutely obsessed with, and have a lot of freedom in, in their schools. And, and I think we need, to some, we need to get to that place where we can trust our educators um, and, and give them, them the, the, both responsibility and, and the flexibility to do what, what it takes to, to actually meet the needs of kids and help them fulfill their real potential. Wendy, I want to thank you for being here, but more importantly, I want to thank you for the extraordinary service that you've helped stimulate and provided and, and the like. Um, it is a heck of a tough problem, mm -hmm. but at least we know which way is uphill, yeah. and uh, the only way to get to the top of the mountain is to keep climbing. So yeah. thank yeah. you very much, thank and you. may we wish you another happy 25 years of, of doing thank the same you. thing. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Yeah.